Inflation is inevitable, and there are two reasons why I'm saying this. First off, based on the lessons we learn from history, and secondly, because of the actions that are being taken right now by central banks and institutions around the world. So, if you want to protect your portfolio from the coming inflationary environment, you need to do the same thing that the big boys are doing right now in order to position your portfolio today for the inflation of tomorrow. Now, in this video, I will first of all discuss why inflation is going to become a big problem in the coming decade, and secondly, and perhaps most importantly, what you can do today to protect your portfolio and ensure your retirement. First of all, why am I so certain that inflation is going to ensue? Well, the way I see it, we're repeating a historical pattern that already took place almost a hundred years ago. The period from 2000 to 2020 is actually quite comparable to the events we saw from the 1920s to World War II and what ensued after. There are some clear similarities between these periods, including an inflationary growth period, a deflationary bust, and what I now expect will be a process of currency devaluation and continued inflation. So let's begin by comparing the 1920s to the early 2000s. Now, the 1920s came to be known in history books as the Roaring Twenties. This was a time when electricity became commonplace and this led to advancements in home life, use of various electrical apparatus such as radios, vacuum cleaners and washing machines. We also saw cars become commonplace and we saw other great advancements in transportation and communications. This was a very exciting time for a lot of Americans and we did indeed see some very significant growth in terms of GDP and also in the stock market. Now this period of time is comparable in my opinion to what we saw in the early 2000s where the technological advancement that was the internet brought about a substantial increase in standards of living and a lot of new innovations. It was during the early 2000s when we really began to leverage the internet to the extent that we are using it today such as for online shopping, developing various various programs and software, and even early iterations of artificial intelligence. In this regard, both the 1920s and 2000s were very similar, in that we had technological advancement leading growth. But these are also very similar periods, because they also coincided with a large stock market rally, what you might call irrational exuberance, which eventually led to a stock market crash. Back in the 1920s, it was excessive leverage in the stock market that led to the eventual collapse in 1929 of the stock market. And during the 2000 to 2007 period, we had excess speculation in the housing market, which of course eventually led to the 2007 housing crisis. The 1920s and 2000s were also very similar if we look at the evolution, for example, of private credit. This was a time when the economy was growing not just because of the government, but because of technology and private enterprise. And as we can see, these were both periods of high growth in private credit. Now, we can also establish a clear relationship between 1929 and 2008, which both triggered a big stock market crash, high unemployment, and what would ensue, which would be a deflationary period. As mentioned earlier, in 1929, what we had was rife stock market speculation. Now, a lot of people were not only investing in the stock market, but doing so through loans. And in fact, it was banks that were actually extending loans to, let's say, retail investors to invest in the stock market. Now, in 1929, a few things happened that eventually triggered a stock market crash. In a very similar way, leading to 2007 and 2008, we had rife speculation in the stock market brought about by what we could call financial advancements. Of course, we later found out that we weren't really advancing at all, but rather that the financial system was hiding some significant risk and that therefore this was unsustainable. Therefore, in 2007, 2008, we got a collapse in the housing market, which again translated to a mass reduction in wealth. Of course, housing is for a lot of people their main asset. And of course, this eventually led to much lower consumer demand, higher unemployment, and what ensued was a deflationary period of slow growth and stagnation. This then leads us to the 1930s and the era of the 2010s. These were both characterized by low economic growth and what we could call a 
mostly deflationary period. In fact, the 1930s is now known as the Great Depression, while the 2010s has often been referred to as the Great Recession. In the 1930s, we saw a huge collapse of the economy. There were a lot of things triggering this, such as adverse meteorological events and also an increase in geopolitical tensions and protectionism, which hampered trade. And in 2010, we also saw a period of slow growth and a deflationary environment. We can see, for example, in this chart, which compares inflation and deflation in the 1930s and 2010s, that in both cases, the US struggled with deflation. On the other hand, we can see that GDP, for example, quickly fell in 2008, then of course had a bit of a natural rebound, but also struggled to grow throughout the following decade. Now, things were a bit different in the 1930s than in the 2000s. A lot of people have criticized the fact that when the economy tanked in 1929-1930, the Federal Reserve did not act quickly enough. But however, we did get substantial stimulus coming in throughout 1933 to 1938, Fed, with FDR, of course, beginning the New Deal, and then, of course, all the wartime spending that ensued. In the 2010s, we did see significant monetary policy. However, this did not really translate to the real economy, as most of this monetary policy simply went to expanding bank reserves. And, of course, this brings us back to today. In 2020, of course, the COVID crisis led to a massive fiscal stimulus, and then we saw a big run-up in inflation, which now seems to be dying down for the moment. Meanwhile, the mid-1930s and 1940s were also characterized by high inflation and very high fiscal spending. First off, let's look at the environment and what was happening in the 1940s to identify how this period is similar to today and why I think that therefore we will see high levels of inflation in the coming decade. Now, during this time, not only was the US trying to escape the Great Depression through fiscal spending, but of course, then this spending really ramped up as the US entered the war. Now, go ahead and look at this chart provided by Lynn Alden in one of her articles, which really greatly explains the situation back then and we can see how it's beginning to develop similarly today. As she puts it, this chat is crowded with information but it's worth to take the time to absorb it. The crux of it is that with interest rates running to the zero bound, fiscal spending takes over. Now as we can see here, the Fed was pressured to lower rates in 1932. And let's not forget that this was also the time when the gold standard was abandoned, around 1933. Now, what we saw during the next decade and a half was a period of high fiscal spending and low interest rates, which were later justified as the US entered World War II. Now, this is what Lynn Alden calls a period of fiscal dominance. Notice how fiscal spending really jumps up and that this is actually funded in great measure through an increase in the monetary base, the blue line we see here, which actually really goes up in terms of GDP. Now, a lot of people would argue that this kind of wartime spending was necessary and that, in fact, it helped lift the U.S. out of the Depression. Well, this is certainly a contemptuous argument. Of course, I am no one personally to fall for the broken window fallacy, but there is definitely some truth in that fiscal spending helped lift the economy. However, it also led to rampant inflation and a huge devaluation in the U.S. dollar. Now, as we can see, we're now witnessing some very similar dynamics in terms of fiscal spending, which is really ramped up since 2020, and the monetary base, which is really increasing in terms of percentage of GDP. We are now entering a situation where fiscal spending is really ramping up, and it seems like expanding the monetary policy is the only way to really keep up with the federal budget. Now, there's a few key reasons why I think this. First off, the way that spending is set up in the US and around the world, it is definitely going to have to ramp up when we think about social security outlays and the expense that this is going to put on the economy. Now, we have an aging population and this is just going to put an even bigger strain on social security spending over the next 10, 20, 30 years. How are we going to finance this? On the other hand, populism and geopolitical tensions are leading to an increased dependence on fiscal policies. In this regard, the geopolitical tensions are already limiting the US's ability to finance itself. For a long time, countries have been holding US treasuries, but over the last 5 and even 10 years, we've seen countries like China, Japan and many others begin to refuse to accumulate more treasuries. This means that the US will no longer be able to print and, in a way, export this inflation, but rather they will have to support their own debt. This, of course, will happen by having first off US citizens buy more of this debt, but also by using what we might call the printing press or basically keeping rates artificially low, which is what happened in the 1940s. 
In other words, I believe we are approaching the end of a long-term debt cycle. We have accumulated massive amounts of government debt, and the only way really to, let's say, deleverage this debt is through inflation. Of course, the US, as many people say, is never going to actually default. Rather, it's going to print the money it needs to raise this debt. Now, this is great for debtors, those people that hold debt, but not such great news for creditors or mainly currency owners who will see their purchasing power reduced through inflation and a devaluation if of the dollar. But as they often say, actions speak louder than words, and we're already seeing the actions of big players such as central banks, countries and institutions around the world that are beginning to position themselves for this. It's appreciated, for example, that gold has recently broken to all-time highs, and this is likely due to increased demand from central banks. UBP believes that these central bank purchases are having a material impact on the market, noting that the World Gold Council believes 50% of gold's price is due to ongoing central bank buying. This trend is likely to continue over the coming months and years as central banks move to increase their gold reserves. Of course, in a period of increased geopolitical tensions, gold can be used as an asset to preserve wealth and maintain relationships through this kind of neutral asset. Of course, this serves to protect a lot of countries, from international sanctions by the US, something that Russia has already been doing for the last two years. If we actually look at the gold chart here, I think we now have enough evidence that to say that we are now in a bullish cycle heading to new highs. The way I see it, we formed a 1-2 structure and are now breaking up above that within a wave 3. This means we still have a significant rally as we finish this 5 wave impulse to new all time highs, meaning I do expect gold to reach much higher levels in the next 2, 3, even 5 and 10 years. On the other hand, it's not just gold that countries have been stockpiling. Energy is also breaking to new highs, and we are seeing countries like China really begin to increase their oil reserves. Energy is, of course, a really important asset, and there's also an argument to be made that with the expansion of AI, energy, the energy needs of the world are going to greatly expand. Kind of like with gold, we are almost now breaking up to new highs, and again, I'm seeing the structure, I'm seeing the potential for a five-way structure to begin developing over the next few years. So, central banks are buying gold, countries are buying oil, and institutions in the US and around the world are already positioning themselves through Bitcoin, something that has really accelerated since the Bitcoin ETF was approved. Bitcoin is already near all-time highs, ahead of the halving, and though we may experience and though we may experience some volatility, and I've talked about how the halving event could be a sell the news event in the coming couple of weeks, I do believe that Bitcoin could go much higher, especially if inflation really begins to ramp up. Bitcoin has been a great hedge against inflation for those in countries riddled by inflation, such as Argentina, and it will also serve as a great inflation hedge as the dollar begins to devalue. We have already seen many institutions and funds begin to position themselves, and I think though it's not going to happen soon, it's only a matter of time before central banks and even countries begin to buy Bitcoin too. As we can see, I also expect Bitcoin to eventually go near 100,000, and though we may experience some kind of deflationary event which could take us back down, I do think that holding Bitcoin for the long term is a must for any wise investor, at least a small allocation, as it will prove a great inflation hedge. So, so with that said, I think we've done enough in this video to prove why inflation could become a huge problem in the coming decade and what you need to do as an investor to prepare. As always, if you enjoy this content, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and also go follow me on Substack where I have my weekly newsletter. I talk about in-depth stock reports, I do technical analysis and a lot more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.